This is EntreEd Talk, the podcast for entrepreneurial educators by entrepreneurial educators. We are your hosts, Toy Hirschman and Amber Ravenscroft. This podcast is created by the National Consortium for Entrepreneurship Education, or EntreEd for short. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the EntreEd Talk podcast. We are so excited to have Martha Rush with us today. Martha's, Martha has taught high school social studies in Minnesota for 23 years, and she founded her first company, Never Bore Education Consulting, in 2016 while enrolled in the University of Pennsylvania's Education Entrepreneurship Master's Program. Boy, that's a long program name. <laughs> Since 2013, Martha has helped more than 150 high school students launch businesses from t-shirt makers to tech firms to social enterprises promoting sustainable products. Martha is also the chief educator in residence at Quarter Zero, a Santa Barbara based company that runs world-class incubators and venture coaching for teen years. Awesome. She has written two books, Beat Boredom and The First 50 Days, a handbook for young founders. Her passion is helping teenagers cultivate their curiosity and shape their own paths to fulfilling, purposeful adult lives. So cool to have you, Martha. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. This is great. Um, so I have just met Martha for the first time just now. So I'm excited. <laughs> this is going to be really fun. So, so Martha, we always start with sort of the, the background question. Uh, so tell us, you know, have you always wanted to be an educator and what was your sort of entrepreneurial trajectory? how did you get started and how did you get from where you started to where you are today with your books and all of the awesome stuff that you do? <laughs> well, I'll try to keep that short because I could probably talk for about two hours on just that topic. But I, that. <laughs> <laughs> I actually started out interested in journalism and my first career was as a reporter uh, at the Wichita Eagle newspaper, but I ended up becoming an education reporter and that's what got me really interested in education and the problems in education. And I felt like being a journalist I could only really see the, the surface level issues and I wasn't really understanding it well enough. So my first round of back to school was to get a teaching license um, about five years after I had graduated from college. So that's how I became an educator. And from the start, I was very much like being an educator, but also sort of thinking at a meta level, level about what being an educator meant. And even when I did my student teaching, it was actually a project for the newspaper and I kept a journal and we published it. So I was pretty, you know, I was really interested in like, how can we make this better? How can we make this better in that problem solving perspective? But I also love teaching. So that ended up now I've been teaching this is my 26th year in the classroom. I, I quickly went from sort of the outsider paying, you know, paying attention to schools, wanting to understand to being a full fledged insider teacher. Um, and I really didn't come around to the the entrepreneurial perspective until about 10 years ago. And, and that happened because I've been teaching economics for a long time, um, regular economics and AP macro and micro. And I was always looking for cool activities, real world applications for my students. And I had them doing a few different competitions and actually heard about the junior achievement was here, was like resurrecting their company of the year competition, which had been their flagship competition, maybe, you know, 70 years ago, hadn't existed here for a while. And I was like, hey, let's do that. So, um, you know, started that process with some kids. And at that point, I knew I hadn't even heard of, you know, Eric Reese or the Lean Startup or any of that. But it was like, how am I going to get kids to start a business? And the first year they they made it to the national competition with a t-shirt business. Um, and that just got me really interested in like, how can I do this better? You know, what are what is the latest approach to entrepreneurship? And and so that's what led me to then really digging much deeper into the entrepreneurship ecosystem. There's so much I want to dive into right here. First, <laughs> I didn't know that you were a journalist. So now it makes so much sense to me, this idea of like storytelling as a process of entrepreneurship. And now it makes 10 million times more sense for me where you came from to versus where you are right now. I do want to talk about Never Bore because we are alumni of this program. And um, I think it really talked towards your trajectory and how you, you know, just you're always interested in learning more and like, how can you improve? So I was wondering if you could talk about how Never, Never Bore came to be, what the goal was of, of your consulting firm and, you know, what is that like? navigating your own business development while also teaching at the same time? 
what you probably know and remember that maybe not all your listeners know is that I was expected to show up on day one in Philadelphia with a pitch. Mm-hmm. And when I registered for, when I applied for the Penn program uh, and I thought about attending it, really for me, it was more of a, I want to understand this process so I can teach it to my students. It wasn't really a, I want to understand it so I can start a business. Um, so that was very intimidating. The thought of like, what am I going to pitch? I don't really want to start a business. And um, I am, I like, I'm kind of a workout enthusiast, but in the summer in particular, I like to swim. So I was swimming laps and I was just thinking like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I thought, okay, I have to focus on what do I actually know? Like, what do I have to offer? And I thought, well, I'm pretty good at engaging my students. Like that's probably like the single biggest sort of implicit skill that I actually have is I can keep kids interested. So that's where it came from, was this idea of, well, if that's what I know how to do, then what I need to do is I need to start a business that that focuses on student engagement. And yeah, it took a lot of time to kind of think about it, but the original pitch went really well, that 60 seconds. And mine ended up being one of the one of the ventures that was voted for. And so I had a team of new classmates working on it and and they really pushed me like that was amazing. One of them, um, Anika. She's like, okay, you need to, you need to like, you know, you need to get a copyright or trademark or whatever on your name. You know, you need to do this, you need to do that. And they, they were like, they were like, you need to start a blog. I mean, they just pushed me. Like, I don't think that ever would have happened if it hadn't been for that sort of unique experience. That's awesome. I, I need to know one thing. Um, is that a play on Poe, the name? Uh, yes. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, you know, I kind of go back and forth on it. I actually have to decide whether to renew my trademark on it. And I was like, I don't know. I, I don't know if I have gained a lot from, from that particularly, but it was when I first thought of that, I was, I, I liked it a lot. So I like it. But when you said journalism, I'm like, I bet that that, cause that was the first thing I thought of. I thought I read it wrong. And when I, I wonder if that's a Poe thing, that's, I, I'm a fan. This is great. And uh, I am very jealous of both y'all's program because it sounds like it was, fantastic and I guess it's the only one that exists that's ever that that's geared specifically towards entrepreneurship education but so what stood out when I'm looking at at some of your stuff is that your your beat boredom book has a mission of this is my favorite engaging (laughs) tuned out teenagers so um oh boy um is that something that that is a big issue across the board and not just I think not just teenagers um I'm, I'm going there, Amber, but I know in elementary school kids, <laughs> just, I mean, it's just because of the, that we're not doing, like you said, want you want to figure out how to do things better. And so please, please tell us about your book and maybe even some cool pro tips that, <laughs> that our audience could maybe use to start helping to engage these, these lovely, lovely, brilliant teenagers that for one reason or another, are out. (laughs) Yeah, it's so frustrating to see that too, you know, because they really are so full of potential and and they like learning stuff when they feel like it's important, right? And and when they feel like people actually care about what they have to say. And that's that that's one of the biggest things. And I, I don't even know if that comes across so much in the book, but you know, that's one of the bits of feedback that I've gotten from my students that that they appreciate is you actually listen to what we say. And you take us seriously. And I'm like, that is so important and uh, so fundamental to, to educating kids. Um, the book developed out of a lot of, on my part, introspection, just thinking what worked, what worked, what are lessons that worked and how can I sort of categorize those, you know, and obviously, um, you know, standing in front of kids and lecturing at them all day, that doesn't work or just giving them worksheets, it doesn't work. I mean, yes, you can get some rudimentary level of they're going to learn something from it, but it doesn't get them excited. It doesn't get them fired up. It doesn't make them want to study that topic more. Um, and that's what I was really thinking about was what are those things that kids are still talking about? You know, they've been out of high school for five years, but they're like, remember that class? Remember when we did that? Um, and, and so that's what I was looking for. And in some classes, that was really easy. Um, I taught journalism for 17 years, you know, and the kids who took journalism, it's like, it's so real. And I think that actually became a model for a lot of other things that I've done, because when you're, when you're doing a school newspaper, and I was very, I've been very fortunate that I worked in a school that, except for one little incident a few years back, there's never, never was an attempt to censor us or, you know, make it just sort of a, a fake classroom experience. The kids were really able to go out and, 
and explore things and interview people and find things out for themselves. And they found that like so exciting and empowering. And I think that translates so well into entrepreneurship. It's, it's so many of the same skills. It's like if kids can, can start a business and talk to customers and talk to resource providers, they're having so much of that same experience and being taken seriously. So there's, there's six strategies in the book that go from like storytelling and discussion, um, competition, and then um, like problem-based learning. And I think a lot of them actually tie to this idea of problem-based learning and the idea that you know, give your kids a challenge, give them something that's unknown. Don't try to program them. You know, if all that they learn every day is, well, kids, you know, if A, then B, when you see this problem, solve it that way. When you see this sentence punctuated that way, when you read this book, analyze it this way. It's like, no, we need to break out of that mold and say, um, here's a problem that, that might have multiple solutions. I might have a solution for it. I might be wrong. Maybe you can offer a better solution for it and really let them dig into it. That's when they get really excited. I think that's so important. We, I mean, we talk about PBL a lot, but I think the idea of replacing project with problem is key there too, because a lot of times you can give a prescribed project that's not getting to meaningful learning in a way that you're describing. Um, I actually use this example. We, I just did a training in Kentucky for Entre Ed, and this idea of how we ask questions is so important, right? Because I was giving the example of what does five plus five equal 10? But if you ask students what two numbers equal 10, you can get a multitude of different answers. And so it's like, how do we frame that? Toys that calls them non Googleable. <laughs> what are they called? Non Googleable questions? <laughs> Ungoogleable questions. Yeah. Yes. That was always the, the cool advice is like give give kids something that, like you said, like you said, Martha, undefined. Yeah. And, and and I think the, the biggest thing I wrote down in capital letters, uh, actually listen. And we hear that so, so much from our awesome educators and stuff that are having great success. And it's really that fundamental. It's and, and you just want to go, duh, why aren't we actually listening? <laughs> why aren't we listening to the kids? And, you know, and then so to be that kind of that guide for them and let them explore those things that are, are challenging, but realistic and, and undefined, that ambiguousness at the end is so important. So I'm, I'm, I'm racking my brain right now because our kids are home and <laughs> trying to think of some really good topics to, un, to for them to get to dive into their nine and seven. So we got to think of something. <laughs> you have a lot of good articles at quarter zero, but I want you to highlight, I mean, we've mentioned 150 high school student businesses is a vast number, especially if you have started this space in the last like 10 years. So I was wondering if there may be one or two that you thought were really, they don't even have to be really innovative, but just that you found were you know, stood out to you um, as successes in that space? Well, just to clarify, 150 students involved in businesses, they didn't all do separate businesses. So 150 oh, businesses about good clarity there. A lot. <laughs> that would be a lot. No, um, it's still, still pretty important. <laughs> it, it's still, it's still a, lot of, a lot of kids. And it's, it's amazing when I look back on it, how much I learned from working with them on it. I mean, the first businesses were really pretty pretty simple, like let's do screen printed t-shirts, kids will do the design, you know, we'll find a, a resource provider, sell them to student groups, you know, it was pretty simple. But um, there's two that I think are, are really the most interesting to me. One is one from about, I think, I think most of the kids graduated in 2016. Um, and that group, they called themselves Radian Tech, which doesn't really indicate much about their product. They developed a product called EduPass. And they actually started out the school year um, and they had a, a mentor, um, a local young entrepreneur in his 20s. Um, he has since gotten married and had a baby and he's not involved with our program anymore. <laughs> um, but he was great. He was so enthusiastic and he really knew his stuff. And, and he was working with them and I was kind of working with them, uh, learning from them. And they started the school year wanting to come up with an app for tracking buses, for school buses. The problem they identified was so many kids, you know, standing out there waiting for their bus to show up you know, parents not knowing when the bus is going to get the kids home. And they were like, look, we have GPS, we have trackers. Like, why is there not a system where you can just look on your phone like you do for Uber and see when your school bus is going to arrive? And they ran into roadblock after roadblock after roadblock with this, you know, including our school district being like, basically, no, we're not going to buy it. <laughs> we're not going to use it. And, and even calling me and saying, like, tell your kids to back off. We're not going to use this. And I was like, 
what? Like, why would you be so, you know, hard on them? And I get, it's very nerve wracking to buy a tech product from a group of teenagers, right? You're like, what if it doesn't work? You know, what if we promise this to the parents? But at one point they were really, um, really gung ho, like they were going to get Minneapolis public schools and they had all this stuff and, and their enthusiasm was really contagious, but, but they ended up having to pivot and they just realized that the bus thing wasn't going to work. And so what they came up with instead was a flexible scheduling app. A lot of schools had been moving toward, including ours, incorporating maybe an hour in the week or an hour every other day where kids could go, instead of going to a class, they could go get help from a teacher or they could, you know, go work on a group project in a particular location. And it's a bit of an administrative, you know, hassle because it's like, well, who's taking attendance? Who knows where the kids are? And in high school today, everything's very like, we have to know exactly where they are. Um, so they, they created this flexible scheduling app that um, allowed you to, as a teacher, invite kids to come to your room. Um, kids could check in for where they were going. Kids could send a message and say they wanted to get help. They could either try to meet with their friends or they could be anonymous from their friends about where they were going. And they ended up selling it to a couple school districts, which was really cool. And just such a great experience. I mean, I heard those kids, you know, interview customers. I heard those kids pitch. I heard them, you know, speak to our staff about using it. And they got, they ended up getting written up like in the newspaper, they got on the local news and it was just, it was super cool. And, and not only that, but those kids, many of them have gone on, you know, one of them ended up, um, he's, he is at the, well, was at the University of Minnesota. He's taken a leave. Um, he started uh, a, a new app. It was called Renera, and I think it's now called Pickup. He actually went to quarter zero camp too. Um, and they ended up becoming a, a target tech star, got a list funding, and they're, they're running this program that's basically last mile delivery. So like, if you're going to target, you know, you let your friends know through this app, like I'm going to target and they can ask you to buy certain things for them. And so it gets, you know, kind of eliminates that need for so many people to go run errands. So it was really, you know, seeing some of these kids take what they learn and go on. And it's not about whether their first venture succeeds or even their second, but just to see them kind of continue with that and be so excited about it has been awesome. I mean, the fact that they pivoted that quickly and then still sold to school districts, which are a historically difficult customer in yes. the same year is incredible. <laughs> yeah. And that's, I mean, and, and I mean, how empowering for them, but how to do it in the face of what probably felt very bad. <laughs> Major resistance. <laughs> and I'm surprised because that is a fantastic idea. I would love yeah. to have that app. And they have yeah. it at colleges like you, I mean, we had it for our housing complex at colleges. Like it's a great idea, but there's probably security. I mean, there's probably a bunch of underlying issues that obviously, but the fact that they pivoted that quickly shows a lot about those students yes. and their resiliency, which is awesome. Wow. Can yeah, and one of the one of the girls in that group, her name is Amy. She was, I think she was a freshman at that time. And I remember she came back to school the next year and she was like, we were at Perkins like 40 hours a week working on it all summer. Like she was just so gung-ho, like this is great. Well, Amy, by the time she was either a junior or senior in high school, she'd been involved in founding multiple businesses. And she ended up being part of another group. And now it's run by just, just Amy and a girl named Hafsa, who's a senior. They decided um, that they were really committed to reducing plastic waste, plastic bag waste. So totally different direction, right? Not an app at all. They ended up um, developing water-soluble plastic bags for local stores. And this all started from Amy working at like a local boutique and just seeing how many, like just piles of plastic that she was taking out to the trash every day. Huge problem. You know, how can we reduce plastic waste? And so Amy and Hafsa, and, and at that point, I think they had maybe four or five other team members. They started looking at like, how can we do this? You know, they, they talked to researchers at the University of Minnesota. They found out like what kinds of materials could be used. They ended up finding a company, I believe in Chicago was what they settled on. They were going with a company from Canada for, at one point, but that, that made these water soluble bags. It's the same material that's used in like Tide Pods. So that plastic that's on the Tide Pod, um, and it was only being used in, um, for like hospital waste. So, you know, or I, I shouldn't say waste, sorry. It was being used for like, um, hospital uh, laundry. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you collect all the dirty, like stuff from a hospital, you know, towels and various materials, and you would put them in this plastic and then wash them. And then the, the bag would, would dissolve. And they were like, well, we could use this for other things. So 
they ended up developing that. And actually there was a boy involved in that named Michael. He's now at Stanford. He's developed his own completely different enterprise. Amy ended up getting a, a full ride scholarship as an entrepreneurship student to the University of St. Thomas. Um, and now Amy and Hafsa, they probably, between various competitions, they've gotten like twenty to $25,000 in seed funding for, for Solupal. Um, and they even met with somebody who was willing to fund buying them their own machine to manufacture the bags themselves. So that's kind of up in the air right now, but it's like, look what they're doing. You know, I mean, these, that was the first group that actually had to help through the process of like, how do you set up your own bank account and like what legal agreements and stuff that I was not at all prepared for. But, you know, when you take them seriously, you take the kids seriously and the ideas seriously, there's really no end to where it can end up. There isn't, um, there's no ceiling, you know, they, they can be doing this for the rest of their lives. I have no idea. That's so amazing. Can't, let me ask you this question. I think I know the answer. <laughs> I'm going to find out. Um, so you have these groups of kids and they're, I mean, those examples are mind blowing, but can you speak to like, are these, are these particularly, you know, rocket scientist types of kids or like these super academic superstars that everybody thinks, oh yeah, not, not everybody can just start a business. We, <laughs> I would say it, it, it's a mix, right? I mean, some yes, some no. I, I don't, they're not necessarily all straight A students. I'll say that, you know, without commenting on any of them specifically, there's certainly kids who have had those accomplishments who, you know, got C's in my AP micro class. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't generally see kids who are, who are failing being successful because I, you know, there's a degree of resilience and persistence that they need. And um, but I also do believe that there are kids who are who are failing and struggling because they're bored in class, because they're not challenged. And I, I that I think we could turn around with opportunities like this and, and teach them how to be more resilient, persistent learners across the board by getting them engaged in something that they're excited about. Yeah, I would, that's why I asked that question, because we we try to communicate that to educators all the time that this is, it's more, it's even more than starting a business. It's once you get that, they have that, that success and that feeling. And then they have that mindset of it's okay to fail. It's okay to have to change. It's, and, and I, and I'm capable of doing anything. And Amber and I talk a lot about how we wish somebody had done that for us. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Amber's you know. a lot younger than me, but you know, even 10 years ago, 15 years to, to have that empowering feeling. And you're like, you're, you're launching these kids on this amazing trajectory whether they go off and become a business owner or not. So I just think that's really empowering and awesome. Awesome what you're doing. I can't, I want some water soluble bags now. <laughs> <laughs> I can hook you up later. <laughs> I'm really fascinated by just, I mean, just with Amy alone, right? Her example of her working on so many different things that have not really a connection at all. Like the, her ability to pivot and just be fascinated and all those different aspects of like what she's interested in at the time is huge to me because that freedom, I think, beats boredom. And you talk a lot about different ways that you create these opportunities for your students at quarter zero as the chief educator in residence. I love that they call them tips from the front. I think that is <laughs> incredible. So I was wondering if you could share maybe like one or two of the things that you found to be the most important for educators to allow people and students like Amy to flourish in this kind of environment? Great, well, I think they, all the tips I have boil down to one tip, which is take the kids seriously, take their ideas seriously. I think it was the hardest thing for me to overcome. The number of times that my students proposed, you know, a particular product and in my brain, a little voice was saying, that's a dumb idea or you're never going to be able to do that. <laughs> no one's ever going to buy that from you. Like that's, and, and I can't be the only one. Like, I just think that's so prevailing among adults in general and maybe teachers specifically, but you know, we all believe in this sort of lockstep, like, no, you're going to, you know, take all these classes and then you're going to go to college and then you're going to have this, these skills, and then you're going to go to work here. And the idea that, you know, a 16 year old who's like, Hey, I've got a great idea for this like life-changing app, you know, our, our gut instinct is like, no, there's no way. There's no way. And, and sometimes kids will literally come up with ideas that they think are off the wall and preposterous because they want to test whether we really believe in them. And, and they will, you know, well, I'm going to do this, this, this. And you have to, you know, it's, it's very hard as a teacher to be like, okay, well, how's that going to work out? Like, where are you going to get the resources? And, and you have to persist in, 
in believing in that. And you have to just keep at it until they start to believe it themselves or they say, look, we were just messing with you. Like, okay, let's, <laughs> we, we really don't want to do that. You know, we really want to do this. But I would say nine out of 10 of my students' successful ideas, I did not think were going to work. And I think that's a pretty important thing for teachers to think about is we have to really, we have to self-censor. We have to, we have to take our bias out of it. We have to realize that we don't really know what they're capable of. And so we just have to support them. And that's what I love about the whole, you know, that lean startup process is it doesn't require me to do anything except, okay, have you interviewed people? You know, I just keep asking them questions like, who have you talked to? What percentage of your customers say this or that? And it's like, it's, it's like magical. You just trust the process. And if it's not going to work, then it won't work, but you won't, you won't have wasted thousands of dollars. You know, there's kids have spent some time, but they've learned some skills. So it's okay. It's all a, a good trade. That's very cool. That's amazing. That that's a perfect tip because we do, and we do see that we have a lot of well-meaning adults and educators, and it's just kind of your gut, your gut, like, Oh, well, I don't know about that. You know, I mean, I can't even tell you how many I thought were really great ideas that people were like, no, <laughs> <laughs> and and I listened to them and I shouldn't have listened to them. <laughs> yep. Yep. Very true. Hi, all. We are super excited to offer an exclusive discount for our listeners to attend this year's EntreEd Forum taking place on November 18th and 19th in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We have an incredible lineup of speakers and experiential learning opportunities to help you ignite entrepreneurial thinking and integrate entrepreneurship into your learning communities. Use promo code ENTREEDTALK to receive 5% off of every individual registration. Again, that's promo code ENTREEDTALK. To learn more about the forum and register, visit www.entre-ed.org today and subscribe for updates as we launch new things happening every week as part of the planning for the forum. Thanks. See you there. How do you, and you did actually, I think a series of articles on this, and I think this is something that's emerging, and I've heard educators say this a lot, is like, the idea of communication with outsiders and students are very hesitant to talk to strangers. And like, that is an entrepreneurial process learning about your customers. So, I mean, how do you, get, how do you encourage them to do that? That's such a good question. And I think it really, that's one of the things, and I know I said this in one of the, the blog posts, but that's one of the things where journalism really helped me. I mean, journalism students have a hard time talking to strangers too. And I didn't realize until probably years into advising the high school newspaper, how scary it was for students to go talk to the principal. You know, because the principal is somebody I knew and like, you know, basically sort of, sort of a, a friend, like somebody I could just chat with. I ran into her and I'd say, well, go, you know, go interview the principal. <gasps> You know, I'm like, why is that scary? Like, that's, our principal is not a scary person. But it's easy to forget as an adult how intimidating those experiences are for most teenagers. Um, you know, and, and in journalism students, they had to talk to the principal. They had to talk to the superintendent. They had to talk to police officers sometimes. They had to talk to, you know, all kinds of people. And so honestly, I feel like in, in entrepreneurship, it's actually a little bit easier because you're not having to necessarily talk to the scariest of authority figures. You just have to talk to people. I would say, you know, one of practicing is big, practicing interviewing, practice asking the questions and actually set it up. So, you know, they're practicing asking questions of somebody who's role playing an antagonistic person, right? They need to just, they need to practice that. How am I going to react if I go up and say, uh, excuse me, I'd, I'd like to ask you a few questions about uh, what kinds of coffee cups you use. And a person says, I don't have time, you know, get out of my way. Who are you? Like they need to be prepared for that because yeah. that honestly is probably going to happen. But also I think uh, sending them out in pairs is huge. You know, having, having someone with you makes everything easier. So that's a big piece of advice. Don't, don't expect kids to go out and interview people by themselves. Let them go in pairs. That's a really, really good idea and tip because that I, like, if you try to think back to your kid brain, you know, if you have a partner in crime and you get rejected, the other person, you have each other <laughs> to go, it's fine. <laughs> we'll just ask the next guy, you know, but that's when you have a crush, your friend tells them. <laughs> 
<laughs> I don't like for that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I remember even like when I was a little kid um, selling Girl Scout cookies, you know, door to door, because that's what we did back then. And um, my my friend Ann and I would always go together, you know, because then if people were like, no, go away, you know, we would like make fun of them as we walked away, you know, which you know, if you're by yourself, you just have hurt feelings. You're with your friend. You're just laughing about it. That's so, so true. Oh, we all have that kind of alone experience. Of <laughs> yeah. And it's true. The principles are like magical unicorns sometimes to these kids. I didn't really, I didn't remember that either. And then watching my own kids and students, I'm like, we'll just go down and talk to what? <laughs> <laughs> or we'll see a teacher at, you know, at, at a restaurant or something. And it's like, Oh, hi, you know, <laughs> just a person. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it doesn't seem that way to them. Wow. That's, that's, that's great. Oh my gosh. So you have another book coming out. We want to make sure we highlight that. And it's, it's called the first 50 days, a handbook for young founders. And can you talk a little bit about that and, and what people can expect to, to see coming down the pike from you? Cause we want to make sure that everybody knows about it. Well, I am so excited about it. It actually, last summer, so about a year ago is when I started working with Quarter Zero. And um, my first job there, well, I had two things. I was writing blog posts for them, and I was also helping them um, put their curriculum into words. Uh, the founder, Josh, is a, just a genius at working with kids and at the whole lean startup process. And he had basically run the camps himself, you know, for years. And and you run and get into that situation where it's like, okay, we need to be able to broaden this and have other people run it, but all of this is in Josh's head. Um, so my job was to extract information from Josh's head and put it on paper so that it could be replicated. So I worked a lot with him at a pretty frantic pace in like April, May, and June last year for their camps. And after that was all done, we were like, oh. yeah, um, Josh said kind of an offhand comment, like, you know, we should write a book together. And I was like, we should write a book <laughs> about this. And, and luckily I'd already written one book. Um, so I kind of knew how that worked. And I just started, you know, how thinking, how can we take what my experience, his experience, these camps, everything that we know. And of course the things I've read, like the startup owner's manual and the lean startup and all these things. And how can I turn that into something that's going to be really user-friendly for kids and teachers? You know, how do you get the right tone? How do you break it down to the right steps so that, a kid could pick it up themselves or a teacher could pick it up and say, hey, kids, like read this section, you know, short little, you know, a couple pages at a time, lots of examples, um, and just make it something so that other kids can benefit from what we've learned, right? And, and teachers can benefit from what we've learned. So, um, so I started writing it in the fall. Um, it's been, you know, reviewed and, and edited and through a lot of conversation and sort of co-developing with a group called, a design group called Very Nice in Chicago. They've designed um, a first 50 days toolkit that's going to be free open access online that goes with the book. Super exciting. We're developing more curricular materials. The camps are now incorporating the book and we're also incorporating, like I'm developing um, rubrics that teachers can use. So let's say you do have your kids say, um, you know, conduct problem interviews or do a product positioning statement or create their MVP, whatever step in the process, like ways to help teachers kind of assess that process because we know it's really important for teachers. So I'm just really excited about all the materials that are being developed. And I think on a little side note right now with all this, you know, how are we going to teach kids all this stuff online, right? We have really like our brains have already pivoted to like, how are we going to make all of these materials available so that kids and teachers can access them online and have a meaningful entrepreneurship experience, even at a time like this. And so I'm really excited. I, I, I don't love that. I don't love that we're all doing online education. I don't love that we're, you know, stuck at home. And I certainly don't, don't like having this virus, but I do like the fact that we can respond by saying, how are we going to make this um, meaningful and build this up in a way that, you know, it's going to help right now, but it's also going to exist um, in the future. I think that's so powerful. We've been talking a lot about, you know, at this point, it's it's necessary for everyone to be entrepreneurial. So I'm throwing this out there because at Entre Ed, we really tout this idea that entrepreneurship can be taught in any classroom. And so I know that you came into this world from, you know, economics and like you're really in a very structured program in certain ways, but you also teach social studies. So I was curious if you've seen any of the entrepreneurial programming that you're doing in your economics courses kind of filter into how you teach social studies and if that has impacted your approach to educating in that 
more traditional sense um, as well. So at this point, I don't teach any history classes. <laughs> so just to be clear, <laughs> which is sort of what people think of when they think of social studies. I do teach psychology. Okay. Um, and I think there are pieces of it, yes, that have. And I think that can happen even more. Um, I, I would love to see a, a situation where kids in the course of their high school career are either doing an entrepreneurial venture or they're doing some sort of um, like political involvement venture or they're doing some sort of social venture. I feel like every kid, you know, or maybe maybe you could also add in, I haven't thought this all through, but maybe like a scientific exploration, right? Like every kid should have the opportunity to do some kind of self-directed, you know, project that, and I, I hate to use the word project, but something that they're they're doing their senior year, almost like a, a capstone or whatever, that fits what they really care about. So let's say a kid does really, you know, is is very interested in history, then, you know, entrepreneurship, the, the same skills go into like a historical, um, you know, exploration. Mm -hmm. My first master's is actually in history. And I, I wrote a master's thesis on desegregation in the Minneapolis public schools. And the process, you know, I, I went on and interviewed people, right, who'd lived through that time. I interviewed the guy who'd been the superintendent of schools for the Minneapolis Public Schools that time. I interviewed some of the um, African-American leaders in the community. I interviewed lawyers. Like, those skills, they, they transcend any one subject. The ability to ask a question, to seek your own answers, to go out and talk to people, to do research. So I, I do feel like that can be incorporated in a lot of different courses. It's most obvious in entrepreneurship and journalism, but it doesn't have to be limited to those. Good, thank you so much for speaking to that. I think we, we argue that all the time. Like we, there are pieces of the process that make sense everywhere. And yeah. so I just wanted to speak, to speak a little bit to that if, if you had taught more traditional classes, which you do, so great, yeah. That's really, I just, um, it's something that Amber and I try to drive home all the time is that, when you say entrepreneurship, kind of like when you say social studies, everybody thinks of history. When you say entrepreneurship, everybody thinks of business. It's got to be yeah. a business. It, yep. it, and we're like, it can be, but it can also be, like you said, like like a historical pr project or a, I hate to use that word too, but like a, or, you know, an, a, a scientific exploration or something. An inquiry, an inquiry. inquiry. Yes. There we go. Yeah. 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 And, that, and that's just, and because you're still using those same mindsets and you're still going through the same process, even though you're not traditionally, you know, starting a sock company or whatever it is. Um, so I'm glad that, I'm glad that you spoke to that. Thank you for asking that, Amber, because that's, that's something that we just really, really try to get teachers to understand that. Mm -hmm. It can be, it can be in any class. It can be in any subject. It can be anywhere. It's just getting to those mindsets and that experience for kids. It's self-directed. Our last question is always like, well, what parting advice would you give to educators? I can still ask it, but you've given <laughs> more, more than enough parting advice. So I was wondering, is there anything else that you'd like to share? I know we talked about truly listening to students, allowing them to really own their learning. Um, is there anything else, especially for maybe our educators that aren't as deep in this world as we all are that you would recommend for them as like a first step maybe so my sort of approach is uh don't be afraid just jump in you know you it doesn't have to we're so used to having to carefully script everything make sure everything is going to be exactly right and i i know i'm really fortunate to work in a school where i've been given some leeway and i know not everybody has that but if you do feel like you know if if you feel super constrained by your school then i would say like try to do it as an extracurricular you know try to offer the kids something outside because maybe that's the only way but once the kids start being really successful at it then maybe your school administration sees that there is something valuable there that could be incorporated into the the, the regular school day but but don't be afraid to just jump in and try and, and see what kids come up with. Because I think our fear and our, our rigid, you know, schedules and, and curricula um, can really hold us back. And it, it's funny, I was doing a workshop with teachers in California and basically I'm trying to get them all on board with, with, with using lean startup uh, methodology. And one of them commented, you know, it's funny that you also teach AP economics because those two things seem so opposed. And I'm like, I don't see them as opposed because when I'm teaching AP economics, I'm still just trying to cultivate kids' interest and excitement and like see this 
curriculum, see this class as like a way to understand the world because if you're gonna navigate in this world, you're gonna be successful in this world, like you need to be able to understand it. And this is like an important lens for that. So to me, it's not, um, let's all get fives on the AP test. I mean, great, I, I like when they do, but it's like, this is a, a learning opportunity and um, it's gonna make you better at whatever you wanna do. And I think that has to be conveyed in whatever class they're in, that this all is gonna feed into you being you, you figuring out what you're gonna pursue, you figuring out what, what problems interest you in the future. And the very first section of the book is all about this building an entrepreneurial mindset. You know, how does your life change? when you have an entrepreneurial mindset and you know if people read nothing else like just read that part because it's such a different process and and the student I referred to earlier Sam um, who's been just a serial entrepreneur already he's like 22 um, he's there's a little profile of him in the beginning there just talking about how how his high school experience was different because he had an entrepreneurial mindset and he didn't go to classes thinking I need to get A's. He went to classes really thinking like, what do I need from this class? What am I going to, how is this, how is what we're doing in this class going to benefit me? And how can I incorporate it into what I need to know? And how cool. Can you imagine if, I mean, if all our kids came to class like that, you know, we would have such a, 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 a lot more fun experience, I think, as teachers. Yeah, I probably wouldn't have got a C in college economics. <laughs> 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 that was my least favorite class of all time because I had no clue how it was. It, but they didn't give that context, like you're saying. Like that is a really essential skill and knowledge to understand. That is just like if it's not applied correctly, and like we're not encouraging yeah. students to think about how it's how it's benefiting them to know that knowledge. Then I could see. But I appreciate that advice so much. Um, Toy, I don't know if you have any thought, final thoughts on that one as well. I just wrote it down because. That's something I'm going to, I'm, that's, I can't wait to read that. <laughs> how, does, how do you, how does your life change when you have an entrepreneurial mindset? That's the, that's the best, the best question and answer that we, you know, that we have with teachers that that's, that's what we're trying to get them to understand. Cause like you said, if everybody came to class like that, man, what a, what a great jumping off point you have as a teacher at that, at that point. I have a volunteer now who's a former student. He and I reconnected a couple of years ago. He's about, I guess, 10 or 11 years out of high school now. And um, he he's so funny because he's an amazing entrepreneur and he basically is an Amazon reseller, right? Like he didn't invent something. He just started, even when he was in high school, he was like buying, uh, you know, Playstations or whatever online and reselling them to other kids. But he built this into this huge business. Um, importing stuff from China and selling it to people. Anyway, he, he's now he actually has moved on. He's now a consultant. He basically consults with businesses on how to build their brand on Amazon, how to use search engine optimization. And he's gone from being someone who, you know, was sort of lukewarm on school to, to someone who is just a passionate learner about everything. He only really needs to work like five to 10 hours a week right now. So he spends the rest of his time like, I'm going to teach myself coding, or I'm going to teach myself this, or I'm going to whatever, learn another language. And and he, he's just amazing. And his, he he said to me, and I think I actually quoted him in, um, in Beat Boredom, but he said, you know, if I would have had that perspective in high school, I would have gone to my English teachers and said, help me write this pitch. Like, help me understand how to persuade people. It wouldn't have been, I'm the teacher telling you how to do this persuasive. I would have been asking for that. And I'm like, yep, that was, that was pretty, that was a huge thing for me when he said that to me, to realize that if our kids think of themselves as in charge of their own trajectory, they're going to demand to learn the things that we have to offer them rather than only comply. We'll just wrap up with that one. <laughs> so how can people connect with you to learn more about your work? It can be on, you know, your website, social media. How, how would you prefer them to reach out to you if they're interested? Um, well, there's a lot of different ways. One is um, to go to Quarter Zero, of course. On the Quarter Zero site, they can follow my blog posts about um, teaching entrepreneurship. I also have my own blog at martharush.org. Um, I have a website, neverbore.org, which has been seriously neglected um, because I've just gotten way too busy with other, you know, writing obligations. So I haven't had as much time to cultivate that. Um, I also have a, a Facebook page called Neverbore LLC, which people can join or like. So those are a few ways. And um, of course, if you go to neverbore.org, there's a, there's a button that people can email me through that. So that's an easy way to contact me personally. Awesome. 
Well, thank you, Martha, so much for being on today. And this was incredible. I'm just so appreciative of what you're doing and, and all of the people that you're inspiring and, and hopefully many more through this podcast now as well. So this, is, this has been incredible. I appreciate you very much. Well, thanks for having me. And thanks for the great questions and conversation. I, I feel like we could all get together at a coffee shop and talk for hours about this and it would be really fun. So maybe some we, that's our goal though, right? <laughs> we, want, we don't want to scare anybody because, you know, we're very scary. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, thank you so much.